This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Bonjour, my name is Alice. Welcome back to my channel. Last year I lived in Ireland and I would often go to the National Gallery of Ireland in Dublin. And so every time I went there, I noticed that one painting in particular caught the attention of pretty much every visitor. This is the painting, The Opening of the Sixth Seal by Francis Danby. Honestly, I couldn't help but stop and stare at it myself. Like, you have to imagine, this thing is really, really big. And what's so captivating about it is its apocalyptic nature. Humans are seen imploring, dying, crying, while godly forces, uh, the forces of nature, are unleashed. It really is something to be standing in front of a painting like that. It makes you feel insignificant. Looking back on history, the discourse and aesthetic of collapse, societal collapse, has come back every time the future of society became a source of uncertainty and anxiety. And it has gained popularity in recent years because of the climate crisis. In fact, natural catastrophes that are occurring more and more often, the pictures that came to us during the world fires in Greece, Australia, the drought in Pakistan, they all, yes, looked very apocalyptic. They triggered the same feeling as that painting I've showed you earlier. The music, film, literature industries all thrive on the theme of collapse. From Apocalypse Now to Don't Look Up, including 2012, the list goes on and on. That popularity of the imagery of collapse naturally has an impact on people's psyche. People talk about societal collapse more often now. In France, the country I was born and live in, 65% of people agree with the assertion that civilization as we know it today will collapse in the coming years. That number goes up to 71% in Italy, down to 56% in the UK, 52% in the US and 39% in Germany. In France again, 35% of those who agreed believed civilizational collapse could happen in less than 20 years from now. During a launch party, Elon Musk declared that society is feeling a little fragile these days and that we need to build that society on Mars. Interestingly, societal collapse is something that both scares and fascinates tech billionaires, but it's not limited to them. You know, Timothy Chalamet, my one and only god, said that societal collapse was in the air. It smells like it. I mean, how often have you heard or have you said, we're doomed anyway? You probably didn't use the term doomed, but you know what I mean. Or things like, humans won't be messed, or we're the lost generation. And yes, it's often said in an ironical way, but you know, it still tells a lot about how we feel. Now, I personally think that this attitude is seriously dangerous, and I'm going to explain why in this video. So I'm not dismissing the reality of climate change and the intensity of climate catastrophes, and I'm not saying that the future is bright. However, I want to make sure we're conscious of what type of symbolism some people attach to discussions on climate change. In other words, I want to investigate the politics of what we're going to call collapse core, see who's really benefiting from it, and I can already tell you that the people who do are not your friends. And before we do that, I'd like to introduce you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Just out of transparency, Squarespace is sponsoring the channel throughout the whole year. And I'm honestly super happy about it because that means I'll have to spend less time searching for sponsors and dedicate more time to produce content, be creative. So that's amazing, really. Now, Squarespace is an all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. You can create your own website around your preferred aesthetic from a catalogue of templates and use it as a landing platform for all the activity you do. YouTube, online shop, blog, podcast, photography, etc. Once that is set up, you can connect all your social media accounts and share content between different platforms. Squarespace can also help you create effective email campaigns to really connect with your community. Finally, they have this very cool feature where you can connect and learn from other creators like Adrien Raquel, who will show you how you can best use the platform. If you feel like Squarespace is made for you and you want to check it out, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you've experimented and you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash aliscapel to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring the video and now let's go back to it. I want to spend a little bit of time on the symbolism of collapse. So the painting I showed you earlier is inspired by the Bible's book of Revelation, which contains a series of apocalyptic events called the Seven Seals, announcing the second return of the Christ. In fact, many passages of the Bible draw back to the apocalyptic tradition. Historian François Hartog explains that the apocalypse accentuates the present but transposed into a negative form. In the apocalyptic tradition, the present is such that there is no longer any escape. Refusal, rebellion or any other action is futile. 
There is nothing to be done except watch as the end approaches and prepare ourselves for the encounter. In the context of the climate crisis, such tradition finds concrete meaning. You know, humans have been too greedy and they will pay for it. They will suffer until they face collective death. To be fair, it's kind of the message hidden behind a lot of today's dystopic movies. However, the spiritual message isn't as obvious as um, in the Bible story, simply because a lot of people wouldn't buy it. No, no, no. For people to believe in it, it has to be real. It has to be scientifically real. Economist and futurologist Emmanuel Ash looked at how the biblical apocalyptic tradition was progressively translated into scientific work. With the Enlightenment, science became the ultimate source of truth. Some researchers sought to materialize societal collapse in scientific terms to give that scientific legitimacy to the biblical apocalyptic story. So you have, for example, economist and prized Thomas Malthus' controversial work on population and production, who warned that if population continued to grow, we wouldn't have enough resources to feed everyone. His conclusion was that we were heading straight towards societal collapse, and he was wrong. I don't have time to go through every counter-argument to your theory, but you can find them on Malta's Wikipedia page. Then later, William Stanley Jevons announced the downfall of our societies because of the progressive exhaustion of coal reserves. Again, he was wrong. More recently, Jared Diamond's international bestseller, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, published in 2005, was a massive success. As with Malthus, overpopulation was put forward as a major problem in the context of the climate crisis and uh, growing tensions between countries. The book was a source of inspiration for the birth of Collapsology, a scientific discipline invented by Pablo Servigne, who studied agronomy and did a PhD on ants, uh, before he became an independent researcher. Collapsology is the latest incarnation of the apocalyptic tradition in scientific literature. In a book titled How Everything Can Collapse, a manual for our times, Servigne and co-author Raphael Stevens try to predict how and when societal collapse will happen. Any guess, audience? I'll give you three options and you pick one. 2020, 2050 or 2080. Well, in 2017, Servin said that he thinks collapse would happen in 2020. So like Malthus, Javins and the others, he was wrong. Nevertheless, Servin remains very popular. He's regularly invited on French media, his books sell really, really well, and he got translated in English, which is a big deal for French authors. As philosopher Charbonnier explained, Servin started um, gaining popularity by fostering the idea that we must accept the necessity of letting things be abandoning all hope and learning to die. But he has changed since then, or at least adapted to a scientist and journalist criticism that compared him to a pseudo-prophet, a modern-day Jesus. So in his second book, published in 2018, Sabine is more optimistic. He opens a window for renewal, a sort of redemption. Amid the ruins of the industrial order will be an opportunity to negotiate a radical reinvention founded on self-sufficiency and subsistence agriculture. Yeah, that is cottage court, basically. But I guess we've learned by now what the limits of such approach are. In fact, Charbonnier understands Pablo Servin's utopia as reserved for a tiny minority who, by inheritance or willingness to pack it all in, have bagged a patch of fertile land and learned to tend it. Collapsology, he concludes, is a survivalist discourse that is fundamentally apolitical in nature. So yeah, a few questions are raised. Who will take part in the afterworld? Who will be saved? Who will be left behind? Interestingly, these are the same questions one might ask themselves after hearing Elon Musk talk about the City on Mars project. And I don't think it's a coincidence. In fact, everything is pretty much connected. Little parenthesis here, but trust me when I say that when I was researching this video with a friend, we couldn't help but feel like that meme with the red lines everywhere. We had to remind ourselves not to go into conspiracy mode, but you'll see what we found and I think it's pretty interesting. Okay, let's turn on investigator mode here. Basically, when you go on the French Wikipedia page of Collapsology, you discover that the University of Cambridge has created a center that is kind of similar. So they call it the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, the CSER. They talked about it on the BBC because they theorized a robot appraisal. Terminator style. They were also featured in The Guardian in a very clickbait article on Climate Endgame. The centre, despite being related to Cambridge, has been criticised multiple times by the scientific community for being a bit dodgy. They also received funding from the John Templeton Foundation, founded by philanthropist and enthusiastic Christian John Templeton. 
On the foundation website, you can find the mission in a way, which is that uh, they are trying to persuade people that no human has yet grasped 1% of what can be known about spiritual realities. So we are encouraging people to start using the same methods of science that have been so productive in other areas in order to discover spiritual realities. The marriage of science and religion, basically. So even the John Templeton Foundation saw a connection between collapsology and religion, the spiritual, as we've hypothesized earlier. Now to make things even funnier and add one more red line there, if you go on the CSER website and look at their team, guess who you can find in the advisor section? Elon Musk. As we've mentioned previously, Elon Musk is also a collapse enthusiast. Like many tech billionaires, he gets excited at the idea of a post-collapse futurist world. In an episode of the podcast Grey Area titled Why Are Billionaires Prepping for the Apocalypse, media theorist Douglas Rushkoff, who has been quite close to those billionaires, says that those people don't think like normal people. He believes that their misanthropy is the reason why they choose to prepare for the end of the world by themselves with bunkers and courses on how to become self-sufficient. Rushkoff adds that, in fact, those guys wouldn't even care if society was on the verge of collapse because they could financially afford to organize their own survival and re-emerge as the leaders of a post-collapse society. I don't know if you've watched uh, Glass Onion yet, and I say yet because you really have to watch this movie, because it really encapsulates that tech billionaire selfish mindset through the character of Miles Brown, who chooses to isolate himself from the world on an island and only allow his friends to come and visit him. So yeah, whether we talk about Pablo Servin's Utopia or Elon Musk's City on Mars, it is clear that those projects were meant to be exclusive from the very beginning. In fact, and I know some Serbian fans are gonna get mad at me for saying it, but one of the few differences I see between the two is that Musk can afford to pay for his own survival, while Servin realized that he can't. He needs other people to live through collapse. Collapsology, which is part of the genre of fear, promotes mutual aid for the sake of individual family survival. After doing all that research and try to take Servinia as seriously as possible, me and my friend came back to that clip we mentioned earlier and wondered why did he predict the collapse of society in 2020? I mean, he's a trained scientist. He must have known that was BS. The only answers I found was that one, he wanted to play the misunderstood prophet who's not taken seriously by the establishment, or two, he was doing it for clout. He wanted to get media attention as he was publishing his book. In fact, the more I look into it, the more I see collapsology and anything that centers around the collapse of society as a profitable business. Servigny appears as a guru. The appeal of his books is generated by the fear of not knowing. It creates a world of enlightened, those who believe in him, versus those who are still brainwashed by the system. In a video where Servigny met with a man who has made conferences on the potential collapse of society at a very local level, the man explained that he made people cry. He made people angry, that some refused to believe him, and that he was really happy to finally meet people like him. Servin also mentioned in another video that, yeah, people also cried during his conferences, that scientists would stand up and criticize him. That is weird, guys. It's not normal. It sends cultish vibes. Servin and his friends look like some sort of eco-friendly Anthony Robbins you know, putting in people's head that society will collapse and that they can choose to be part of the people who believe in it and can learn together to live through it is profitable. It has made people like conspiracy theorist Alex Jones earn a lot of money because people who believe in his lies kept on buying his survivalist stuff. And you know, many people, billionaires, continue to worship Musk and fund everything he does because it may give them a ticket to Mars. The rhetoric of the imminent collapse of society is very appealing to um, white, lower to middle class people. When minorities, working classes are fighting for survival on a daily basis, middle classes and upper classes can afford to think long term to envision the climate crisis as the biggest threat on them. The climate crisis, in fact, means the loss of their liberties to take the plane, to have a pool in the backyard, to use a car. The rhetoric of loss, the fear of loss, is something that can only emanate from the powerful. The marginalized cannot afford to be pessimistic because their survival depends on believing that the future can be better, that tomorrow can be better than today. 
This is why I strongly, strongly believe that the climate movement must seek inspiration and be thought through social justice from margin to center, as Bell Hooks said. It has to be deeply political, which is something that collapsology, survivalism, futurist dreams like the city on Mars, etc. aren't. That's it for today. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, we can continue the discussion in the comment section. Don't forget to like, to subscribe if it's not done already. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring the video. Thank you to my Patreons for their support. And a special thank to Donage, Alex, Manuel, Sam, Dakota, Benjamin, Jay, Oswald and Carla. And yeah, I'll see you very soon. This year I'm mainly focusing on YouTube, so I'll be producing two to four videos per month. I'm thinking about doing my usual analysis and maybe one video per month where it would be a bit more casual, where uh, we would talk more about the personal, but we all know that the personal is political. I'm still trying to figure out those things, but um, yeah, I'm really excited about this year and I hope you are excited too. Salut!